interpreted. Hello, folks. In the chat is the attendee um, list link, so if you could sign into that, that would be great. And um, we'll give everybody a few minutes to join. And let me just see if I can pop into here. Um, we have a um, Vadim, I saw that you were, you were in here as well, so that's great. Um, if people have items for the agenda, um, just pop them into the chat and I will add them to this um, list. Um, but I thought um, we'd give everybody a couple more minutes to, to sign, to, to log in and then ask Vadim to give a, an update on the latest release and get any feedback people have. And then maybe talk a little bit about what we're doing in the docs if Jamie's has joined us and by then. Is there anything else that people have um, for the agenda today? FCOS incoming updates. I like that one. Thank you, Timothy. All right. So I about one minute after the hour, I'm going to stop sharing and um, turn Vadim. Vadim, are you there? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna talk, share your screen and talk about the latest release, and then um, we'll motor on from there. Okay. Um, so last weekend we released another version of 4.7. It is marked as a rejected because our test suite has become much stricter and we didn't cherry pick one of the machine config daemon bugs, but you can still upgrade to it. It's perfectly fine. Um, we didn't risk and decided not to pull in latest changes in MCD. They have gone into the latest night list. That means um, the vSphere hardware version bug should now be fixed. Um, and some more hosting changes fixes have been merged in. So that would need some more additional testing so that we could declare it stable and uh, release it maybe this weekend or hopefully the, um, the weekend following up uh, if the tests pass correctly. Um, in other news, Kubernetes 1.21 rebase has merged into 4.8, so, and so did uh, the Fedora Core S 34 next branch. So uh, eventually, in a couple of weeks, maybe we'll start cutting out the release candidates and uh, get some more additional testing on those so that we could declare them stable. On the problem front, uh, the Podman copy bug has been fixed, but we are still getting errors when we're using Fedora Core OS, uh, the latest stable, as a base image in, in installs because of the problems with extended attributes or something. I will be chasing uh, Colin, who's familiar with the situation, to get some updates on this. Um, if I remember correctly, Fedora 34 rebase uh, doesn't have this problem, so we'll get it for free once uh, we get updates to F34. And um, some more good news. We have a new member in our team helping us with OKD specifically. Um, please welcome Mustafa, who has just joined Red Hat and helping with a lot of things related to community and uh, stability. I think the official name is something like stability, which is exactly what we need on OKD front. Um, and, I, and I think I, that's pretty much all I've got from my side. So is that, um, that's Mustafa? Um, yep. If you want to wave and turn your camera on, just say hi and um, introduce yourself. That would be great. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I just uh, find it more comfort to type while it's uh, off. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Mustafa, I'm, I'm based in Berlin. Uh, I'm uh, the first member in the new team. I'm 
I'm helping uh, here and uh, also in the storage team. So yeah, uh, I'm glad to be in Red Hat and hope I can help. And and did I um, mishear Vadim? I think I was on a call last week, an internal one, where there's a number of folks coming on board, um, similar to Mustafa, to help. Um, and they're going to be kind of interning with the OKD working group. So you'll see, um, and we're getting some additional resources, and one of the ways we're training them up is to bring them in via the OKD stuff. So um, that's actually really good news, and, and Mustafa, you're the first face to show up. But um, I heard upwards of 20 new hires, um, and um, so this is uh, going to be going to be interesting to incorporate them and have them understand our CI/CD um, workflows and help us get some stability there. And then they're going to be using that, I think, on the um, OCP itself, on the OCP nightlies as well. So there'll be some a lot of new new faces coming soon. So. That's um, making me very happy, and Vadim even happier, I am sure. So um, Vadim might get a weekend off. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that would be that would be wonderful. That means no no KD releases. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. But it is it is a, a really good sign um, um, that we're getting some stuff resources there, and um, yeah, it'll, it'll be fun. So um, welcome very much, uh, Mustafa. You're very welcome face. So um, yeah, so that's there. Timothy, um, I'm going to put you up next to do um, the update on, unless people have feedback already on this latest release that, or questions. Um, maybe I should allow Mom, that. Yeah, somebody had a question. I heard that. <laughs> um, otherwise, we'll, we'll move on to uh, Timothy's <laughs> update, if that's OK. All right, Timothy, take it away. I think you have to unmute yourself. Yes, all right. Uh, okay, so a quick update on the progress in Fedora CoreOS and what's coming next. Um, so something we've already mentioned is we are going to rebase to Fedora 34. So of course, we'll wait until Fedora 34 is released for that to happen. So the issue tracking that, I'm just pasting that in the chat. Um, and uh, yes, essentially, I think this is going to happen uh, well, rather soonish uh, after the after the release. So the release, I think, it's at the end of the month or something. Um, and uh, yeah, the base will happen a little bit after that. Um, the second item uh, I have is that we are adding OpenShift uh, machine config uh, support to Butane. So we've renamed. Uh, the tool that was called FCCT, the Fedora Config, uh, Fedora CoreOS Config Transpiler. We've renamed it to Butane. And uh, we've also added uh, support directly into Butane, yes, <laughs> uh, to, to generate machine configs. Uh, so that's, I'm pasting the links right now. Yeah, so the, the idea behind the name is that uh, it's uh, it's it's fuel for ignition because essentially you convert you convert your your butane configs uh, to ignition configs. So that's the fuel you you put in your your engine to to ignite it. Uh, yeah, so we are updating uh, our docs already in Fedora CoreOS uh, to mention butane instead of SCCT. That's going to happen soon. Um, so what's important here be, be beyond the name change is that we we had it um, in Butane um, uh, a way to generate machine configs directly, uh, so snippets of machine configs, which should help you if you want to do some very some complex uh, root device or some complex looks setup or things like that uh, in OKG, uh, and that, that should be helpful. So this is uh, I think it's planned for for 4.8, so that probably won't work uh, until 4.8 is released. All right, so that's the second item. Um, then we have two uh, upcoming changes that are much further along the road, much uh, that will happen much later, but we want to uh, raise attention right now about them to make sure that people can plan for it and do the necessary changes if needed. So the first one, uh, which is planned uh, for about two months uh, approximately, 
uh, from now is the C group V2 change. So we decided to split that from the Fedora 34 rebase to avoid uh, having too many things um, changing at once. Uh, so in approximately two months, we'll switch Fedora CRS from C group CB1 to C group C by default. So existing node won't be updated. They will keep using C group CB1, but new provision nodes will start using C group CB2. Uh, so here's the links here. Uh, so I see. Do we have to expect uh, problems with this uh, switch? That I don't exactly know. Uh, it depends on uh, on OKD. Oh, oh, you manage that exactly. I think OKD will probably be, um, uh, stick to C groups V1 until uh, until testing has been done, and that's probably up to Valim to discuss that. Uh, yeah, I can comment on that. We we'll default to C groups V1. However, the only switch is to remove a particular line in the generated machine config. We tested this in CI, and the only tests which failed were related to builds. I didn't look into those for quite some time. But since Kubernetes 120, you should have C groups to be to support in most of the pieces there. Uh, however, it's just not yet stable, so this is why we don't default to it. So this for the request change is important, but doesn't affect us right now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, essentially, everything uh, in the stack is not supported. That's why we we made the switch so late because uh, we were waiting for all the pieces to be fully supported uh, for 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 C groups V2. Um, the 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 unknown here is that I I'm not really familiar be regarding how, how the hip debt is going to happen because usually we well I start. C group to V2 directly. So I don't know how to update from V1 to V2. So that's maybe the tricky part for KD. Oh, to migrate a cluster for, from V1 to V2, because maybe you will have to recreate all of your containers. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. So that's you definitely have to recreate the containers because, so someone someone ran into an issue, um, not in Fedora CoreOS, but in OpenSUSE MicroOS, where I pushed a similar change to switch us to C groups v2 and open as a micro OS. And somebody had a persistent container instance that was just being invoked. And on reboot, it stopped working because the C group of S stuff that it was pulling in for its settings were just no longer there and not available. And so um, if you were going from switching from C group v1 to C group v2, you need all instances that are saved on disk to be destroyed and recreated. Otherwise, they will not work. So um, that is a hard. That seems to be a hard requirement. See, sounds like uh, it breaks things, or isn't it? Well, so normally a Kubernetes system is supposed to handle this transition itself. This is where when you don't have an orchestrator doing that migration for you, like if you're doing this by hand, yeah, you could technically edit the existing running container instance and change all the settings, but like that's such a pain in the butt that it's easier to tell people who are running, you know, Podman or Docker or whatever on, on a machine directly to just like, just blow away, re, re-instantiate your containers, because that should be fine. In a Kubernetes context and an OKD context, machine config operator should tell the rest of the operators managing the OKD cluster that instance, that container instances, pods need to be reconfigured. But because Kubernetes instantiates them from pod definitions rather than leveraging the base container runtime's own ability to save container instance settings, uh, we may not be hit by this issue, but it is still something to be wary of if you're instantiating containers directly on the machine. So from a general FCOS perspective, don't expect your instances to survive the transition. But from an OKD perspective, I don't know of a reason why we would be in trouble with the transition. Um, Vadim, do you have any reason to believe we would have a problem with that transition? No, we shouldn't, because the change from C group C1 to V2 is effectively a kernel arguments change, meaning that requires a reboot. And the old containers would just be destroyed, or rather 
the new kubelet would not be able to pick them up because they don't look as it expects them to be. So it would recreate them automatically. But uh, if you're have... running some Podman containers there, yeah, those would be dead. But if you update to a version of FCOS with this change, we have um, uh, nevertheless a uh, reboot. I yeah, think but updating FCOS yep. machines yep. always requires a reboot anyway. Yeah. We've always yeah. required that. Yeah. So my my guess here is that because of the smartness or dumbness, depending on your point of view of how this actually works in Kubernetes, uh, it should actually be transparent to OK users. Yeah, thanks for the context. Um, so if I find my notes again, yeah. So that's the group V2. So that's coming in approximately two months. So yeah, after we rebased on Fedora 34. Um, all right. And the last item here um, that I have is uh, Fedora count, Fedora Cores count me changes. So we're changing. Uh, we're adding a way to to count um, count the number of uh, Fedora Cores nodes and how long they live. Uh, it's something that we're rolling out across all RPM three based variants of Fedora. So it's not just Fedora Core S, it's Silver Blue 2 and um, Fedora IoT. Uh, and it's um, so it's not enabled yet in Fedora Core S, but it will be available uh, enabled in uh, Fedora 34 um, for Silver Blue and IoT. Uh, so yeah, we want to, to we wanted to give a, a longer heads up for Fedora Core S users. So this one is going to be available, is going to be enabled at least uh, not not before three months, so uh, in, in stable. So you have three months to decide to look at the change and decide if you want to uh, to be counted or not. Uh, so the issue and the notes are here. Uh, essentially, it's a very very uh, it's a highly privacy preserving, uh, it doesn't store anything, it doesn't send anything. Uh, it just basically says uh, to the Fedora servers, hey, I'm a Fedora chorus node and I'm, I've approximately uh, lived this amount of time. And it's very approximate, you, you basically cannot derive anything from that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a really, really small um, counting method. Uh, really, really, and we 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 really care about privacy here. So, uh, but yeah, if you feel uncomfortable about that, there's no issue at all, and you can easily disable that. It's just uh, just uh, a, a, a short a short uh, masking a simple unit, and that's it. And and you can do that ahead of time too. So if you do that right now in your nodes, uh, in a, in machine config, uh, you will never be counted. So. Uh, yeah, that's um, mostly it. The, all the details, the, um, how to disable that, it's it's all written uh, in links in in documentation that is uh, linked into uh, the issue I've just linked, and we'll make uh, public posts uh, on the Cores uh, status mailing list. We have a blog post on Fedora Magazine coming up too, so uh, this is going to be very public too. And all right, and that's mostly it for me for f incoming Fedora first changes. So um, just to be clear, the, the telemetry doesn't tell you that they're running the Fedora Core OS in OKD in any way. That's not going to be any visibility of the, wh what the source of the Fedora Core OS is? Yeah, it's uh, there's nothing that would tell us that you are running in OKD. I don't think so. Is there? Yeah. Okay. But it just. Yeah. Sorry. It's it's just a, a count of how many. Not it doesn't even identify the source company. It's just very. Just a count of how many Fedora Core OS instances there are out there in, in the universe. Yes, we 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 absolutely do not send anything. Uh, about the node uh, as part of the of the request, it's, we we essentially make only one HTTP GET request, 
and uh, what's it's it's the only information that we are sending with this request is that we are in federal QRS uh, system uh, using RPMOS3 and uh, that we've lived approximately about one month, one week, uh, four months or more than that. And the federal version at any, so it's, if it's federal 30, if we're better than federal 33 or 34, but that's about it. We don't send host names. Uh, well, we don't send IP address, but when you make an HTTP request, the server has your IP address. But we don't send the, the actual node IP address. We don't send uh, any other information. Yeah. That's good. That's it's great. That'll be helpful. Uh, definitely for, for everybody who's in the in the community to, to have some visibility of that. That'd be great. Any other questions for Timothy? Um, other than I think maybe a, a blog post post I think might uh, on the C groups V2 stuff just so that people don't freak out when they hear it, because it doesn't sound like it's as big of a deal as um, it, sa it sounds scarier than it is, I think. And so maybe a short blog post about that, um, because when people read that, they may freak a little bit. Um, but it was great to, if we can test that early, that would be great um, and get some feedback on that. So then inform the OCP engineers as well if something goes awry. That's a, a great use. Yeah, the the Federal Quest, the sorry, the C groups V2 change is live right now in Federal Quest Next, the next stream. So if you want to try that out, in your notes, uh, you can do that. Okay. So uh, so I'm going to switch topics just to docs for for a little bit, um, and people don't have questions for Timothy, just because. I wanted to sync up with um, Bruce around his the taxonomy work that he was doing that was just a gist file the last time I looked um, from the docs working group last week. Um, Bruce developed a nice, a very nice taxonomy. I don't know if you want to share that again. Did you get any further with that in terms of, um, because it, blogging, I, I committed to creating a blog out of that, um, or are you in the throes of um, exams? Uh, well, I am in the throes, but I, I did add a few more words at the top. Uh, you wanted about 200 words, and I don't think I quite got there, but... Uh, That's okay. Uh, if you, I can if you want to just share, the... share that with folks and maybe walk through walk through sure. it quickly, and then um, uh, I'll explain what we're going to try and do with this in terms of creating a, a primer on um, or a checklist for people who are doing installs and deploys and... Let me just find it. Okay, and then I I did think I saw Jamie on the call, so I'm going to put Jamie on the spot next. So. Get ready. Okay. okay. So this should be correct. Yep. Okay. So there's the. Uh, the gist. Uh, that should get you to it. Okay. Do you um, want me to share the screen and and then um then make my uh, sure. Easier. And and then you can just explain what it is that we're doing, and I'll just share screen. It's just a text document, so uh, it, it's meant to be read with uh, word wrap on. Uh, uh, otherwise, as you see, the things go sort of off into the sunset on the right-hand side there. There we go. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. And I don't know if you can do that. Turn on word wrap from the. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you should be able to see the screen. Get the rid of my. Screen. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, the the idea was just that. Uh, uh, a lot of people uh, produce some excellent uh, guides. Um, I'm probably a little bit partial to Craig's because uh, that was the one that uh, I was first most successful in getting running, you know. But uh, often you need to make modifications to them based on your local situation. Um, and so I was, uh, you know, basically trying to pull out in a visible way 
all of the choices that you need to think about if you were setting up a UPI uh, distribution. Because, uh, you know, sometimes the choices are deeply hidden in the, uh, uh, the setup stuff. So, for instance, uh, going with, with Charos, uh, you pretty much have to get in and actually uh, look at some of the scripts to figure out what he's doing. Uh, and uh, in many cases, I, I think the choices that you make uh, aren't critical to get the end result running, but you do have to know what you're doing, you know, once you get off script. And it is helpful to know that, I think, because uh, it takes a lot of work to put one of these, you know, blogs or posts or whatever together. And uh, they get outdated almost immediately. And that's just, you know, the way technology goes. I don't think there's anything you can do about that part. But, but I think that if you're sort of aware of the underlying things that you have to do, that that's helpful. And it also might help you pick out the particular uh, guide that you're going to try and follow. Uh, so I was just laying out the the choices, and I, I think it's like I haven't really done anything in one way because I think it's obvious to most people that have been through it. Uh, so I don't take much you know credit for just writing down the obvious. Uh, and I I uh, sort of first pulled out just to uh, get it out of the way. You know the the various uh, uh, you know cloud providers where you can. Uh, uh, use the uh, infrastructure provided, uh, you know, and uh, because in theory, I guess that should be relatively automatic. Um, and uh, then went on to the uh, the UPI, and uh, the so that's a, that's about it. The uh, uh, I think I've got the choices that are in anybody's blogs that I've been familiar with. Uh, so if, if there's any missing, then just feel free to add them in. Um, the one thing that I didn't see much discussion on that uh, I like to do personally is uh, dealing with uh, certificates uh, because the browsers are getting much more hostile these days to self-signed certificates. And uh, since you can get a... Uh, uh, an actual domain for like 20 bucks for a uh, .ca. I think it's maybe 25 for a .com. You know, I mean, it's fantastically cheap. Uh, then it's not that hard to get uh, real certificates. Uh, and because you have to have a, a wildcard certificate, you know, like start on apps dot whatever, uh, then the uh, Let's Encrypt and so on is a bit more picky on who you are to give you that. So uh, that's why that sort of interacts with uh, having a real domain. Um, but again, if you're going to have a, uh, a hobby set up that's not going out on the internet, then you don't really care about that so much uh, until your browser doesn't let you connect to it at all, which I can see coming. Uh, so anyway, so that's, that's about uh, it in uh, more words than I probably should have give, said. So. That's okay. So um, what we were going to do is take that and turn it into sort of a, first a blog post that other people can add on to. So because the blog post you can make a pull request against and merge in other suggestions um, and just using markup. So I was going to take that next step now, um, hopefully before next week, and um, turn that into something. But if people had um, other things um, that they thought should be on there, just um, you can, once it's posted or be prior to it, um, please feel free to layer it on because I, what we're thinking that is this will end up not being a blog post, but as we develop it and add maybe links to little blurbs for each of those items um, and not full on links to the total resources, but to the appropriate snippet, um, that it will be one of the pages in the um, guidance that um, Jamie and Mike McEwen are, have been working on. So. Um, and just another page in there, but I thought we would develop, try and develop it out sort of in a collaborative way by getting people to give um, their tips on, you know, where the best write-up was for each of these little things to get started. Because um, I think the approach that he has here with this, um, it's nice because it's often you start down an install path 
and you don't think about everything else that's coming. You just hit the first install a couple of steps and you forget that you have like all of these things in front of you. Um, so this is kind of, yeah, I like that. The OKD pilots pre-flight check. So if you don't know what, what all of these terms are, don't start. Um, yeah, so maybe that's it. And uh, so that that's, that's and so thank you for, for doing that. We walked through it last week and I just thought, we do that. So if I turn that now into a blog post um, and then post it to the working group and ask people to um, to annotate it, basically um, with links, that would that's kind of where we're going. So cool. And he, he are you a pilot, Bruce? Is that true? Uh, yeah, I am, but uh, o only uh, private license. Hey, come and on up to Gibson. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while since I've, I've flown to Albuquerque over the Rockies. Ooh, nice. Uh, so, um, so that's where we're at with the checklist primer thing that, um, that Bruce has so kindly created. Um, uh, Jamie, you want to take over um, and talk a little bit about where you're at and what the update is on the, um, the docs coming out of the deployment and testing workshop effort? Sure. So the last little bit um, I started on the weekend and probably will finish in the next day or two, which is basically taking all of the dependencies um, that are necessary that are in Chara's article and then putting them into the stub page. Uh, he's got quite a lengthy article, so it's, it's taken me some time to get all the dependencies out. Uh, once that's done, we are good to go. All of the other stub pages have been filled in. Uh, and then we can just merge it in, uh, do a pull request or however we want to do it to get it merged into the OKD repo. Oh, awesome. Um, you're making my day. So that's, that's really, that'll be a really big push, I think, and a great outcome from that working group meeting and, and what we're doing. Um, the other thing is next week we have a docs meeting scheduled. I am not available to run it. Um, and I'm wondering if we want to take a week off. Um, from the doc stuff, um, or if someone else could um, host it, and, and that would have to be a red hatter, I think. I think take a week off, I'd like. I, I don't really actually get the time off. I'm in another session, planning session, so um, it's that's just that. But um, If we want to have it, I'm happy to host it. Thanks. Okay, Mike. Maybe, maybe we will, because then you guys can work through if there's anything with the migration that didn't work or whatever. Um, we'll still have it, and I will give you the power to um, create the, the blue jeans, or I'll just turn the blue jeans on, hit the record button, and go to the other meeting, um, if, that's, if yeah. that's good. Yeah, you can either hit me up with the moderator code or something, Diane. We, we can coordinate okay. offline. Joseph wants to take the week off, apparently. Ah, I, I can see Joseph wants to take a week <laughs> off, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Joseph isn't getting the week off because um, I'm going to thank him out loud in front of everybody for something he's about to do. Um, and he is going to be our OKD person um, on the OpenShift Commons gathering at KubeCon on May 4th. He's going to be um, giving a talk um, that he is going to be recording um, on Monday this coming week. Uh, and so we'll get that, that up and there. And he's going to be our, our voice and face there um, for OKD and um, also OKD going to ARO. So Azure, um, so that's going to be... Yeah, we'll get, I got one little thing. So we're going to do that. And if you haven't registered for the KubeCon gathering, it's free. Um, so just join up there. Um, and the only other good news um, that I have is that um, they finally are printing some OKD t-shirts for me. Um, and it, I, I will have them available at KubeCon itself. So if you visit me in the KubeCon um, OKD um, booth, whatever that is that they've set up for me, um, yeah, then I will get you all links um, to um, get a, a t-shirt and self-order and pick the size and everything it took a bit of doing. And unfortunately, Joseph, the, um, the version of the OKD Panda that you so beautifully recreated and flattened and made hipster cool um, didn't meet brand standards, so they made another Panda, but it's still a Panda, um, and so that's the good news. Um, but I really like Joseph's old Panda, I too. I expect to get a shirt from you, Diane. Someday, someday before <laughs> I retire. It's completely okay. It's a real life panda, but uh... yeah, I yeah, uh, I'm like yeah, someday. So um, yeah, so that's that's the good news. Um, and I'm I'm actually really looking up, looking forward to KubeCon. 
um, and Joseph's talk, and a, there's a whole bunch of other great talks too that a lot of them, a, I just recorded an awesome one on Podman and all the related tools um, by some folks um, at IBM and WorkPay. There's just some really good content there. But KubeCon itself is going to be very interesting. So um, if you're there, uh, come visit me because I'll be the one person hanging out in, in the OKD booth um, for uh, Community Central for a while. Um, I can, if anyone else wants to hang out there, that's a red hatter. I can um, get you in there. It might be bitter at times. It's not. We put a lot of sugar into the lemonade. So. Um, there you go. So cool. Um, yeah. So that's what I thought I had for the agenda. The other thing that we've been working on the docs or thinking about is really an overall docs strategy. And to that end, I think Amy is going to try and join and help us with that because she's done a lot of amazing work with um, the OpenStack community. Um, and so I'm going to try and use some of her expertise in maybe in, you know, working with Jamie and, and Bruce and other folks on, um, and Mike with us on the, on the every other week. So Amy might have jumped off because she had another call at, at the half hour, but um, she'll be there next week too to, to tap. So um, that leaves us with 30 minutes left. Uh, or almost. Are there other things, Vadim, or anyone else um, that you want to bring up or any issues that are burning um, from uh, the Kubernetes um, Slack channel? No, not really. Um, my only worry is that we would need a lot of testing on the vSphere bug and the fix we have in Nightlease. And since it's pretty elusive, it's rather hard to prove that it has gone away. Mm. Other than that, I think we're uh, in the clear. I also revived our relationship with operator framework folks, who uh, and next week we'll start working on the OKD specific catalog. Um, I'm not yet aware of the level of my involvement there. Hopefully, things will just start working, but uh, that might take quite a lot of time, which means we would need some community testing. Um, other than that, I think we're pretty good. So this uh, reshare bug, you mean the uh, hardware version thing? Yes, and okay, nice. other OpenShift SD and related stuff, because the fix is to effectively disable uh, the offloading, I think. I'm yeah. not sure what would be the implication of that, so hopefully we won't have any significant regressions. You have operator stuff. I just put a link to there. I don't know if folks caught that, but there was a conversation um, about uh, Kubert and uh, Tekton Pipelines operator that were added to the wish list um, uh, a couple of days ago, and Christian made an update. Um, so take a look at that. And uh, because of the Respear thing, maybe we could invite the people that reported the bug um, if it uh, works with the nightly. It, it would be great uh, to get a positive result from them. Actually, this was the bug was very poorly managed, and that's my fault, honestly. It originates it from the GCP UPI issue, which has been fixed by... Um, opening ports, it's not reproducible in IPI. And then since it had similar symptoms, folks from vSphere uh, have reported there as well. It took me quite a while to actually figure out that it's in fact a different issue. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So on the vSphere testing, is there an ask for, I got to spell vSphere right, um, is there an ask for this is there a link to the bug and, and what to test test for? Diana, I, I I have a question mark because the FCOS people released a new FCOS versions with hardware version 13. And before uh, this bug was reported, they released FCOS with version 15, which in fact is um, a problem. But currently, FCOS is released with hardware version 13. It, won't be a problem at all, or, or shouldn't be a problem at all with new F, um, uh, OKD installations. So, so we uh, 
should um, I, I don't know how to reproduce it with new installations. Um, users can change the hardware version on their own, and unfortunately, they are very inclined to do so because this fears CSI requires something like 15 or maybe even 16. That leads to people installing things successfully, then changing version, uh, trying to apply CSI drivers, and network suddenly goes down, which is very complicated. It complicates the, the debugging a lot. But apparently it's very easy to reproduce by just changing the version and installing things with OpenShift SDN. I'm going to write up a little vSphere testing protocol for this real quick. I mean, it's basically just a paragraph and some links. So yes. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not I, one that I can test because I'm stuck at hardware level 13 until we actually upgrade our physical hardware. So this isn't something I can even test. And you were the one I was going to just ask if you could. <laughs> I would You're love usually to test my go-to person for that. So. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Very complicated book. But does it... Uh, if if uh, this um, fix does solve things for vSphere, does that mean that also uh, of course people will switch uh, to uh, out of version 15 again? Is is it related somehow to this bug? No. Okay. I think it's fair for initial Fedora CoreOS ISOs to stick to the lowest possible um, version so that. Folks on 6 to 5 could use it, um, and users can upgrade the version on their own if they have to. But it's definitely not related to the current issue. It's actually just a great coincidence that we're starting with the lowest uh, version. Okay. So, um, so is there anyone on this call that can test this? I have never seen the problem. Um, I, we are just stuck on uh, OVE in Kubernetes, and we had uh, we were not uh, brave enough to um, change the network plugin in our production cluster to OpenShift SDN in OKD 4.6. But uh, if uh, if there is a version 4.7 with OpenShift SDN working on vSphere, um, we will try to migrate a cluster. Uh, 4.5 cluster to 4.6 with OpenShift SDN and this fix, if it's available. Is is this something, Vadim, um, that we could maybe get you to put a, a short email out to the group mailing list just to get people awareness of this, to the other vSphere spots, things, and just if you really want feedback on this bug. I'm just trying to think of a little out of the box here rather than just asking in the working group because there are about 300 people lurking on that OKD working group. Um, mailing list. Those right, things. that's that's one of the options. I'm just thinking that it won't be very easy to gather feedback on that. Um, I think I'll start with poking people at OpenShift Dev Slack channel because the feedback loop would be shorter. And okay. if we don't get anything, we'll start with the mailing list. Okay. I, at least you could, um, maybe you could post a link to the issue and ask people to, um, to comment it. I think it's worth a uh, try. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, and, that, and then just ask them for feedback on OpenShift-Dev if that's where you want it. Um, just come over there. Um, so yeah, so Bruce, you sort of sound like you have two maybe volunteers, Bruce and, um, and Joseph, but it probably takes more than just the two of us, two folks. To, to do some real actual testing. So not that you're not worthy. Is there anything else that we should be um, raising up here? Anything else anyone's I, working on that's exciting? I have a question. Um, I raised it up on the dev and I didn't get a response, but maybe nobody does that. Um, so I'm playing with Istio um, 1.9.2. And one of the things that I seem to have found is that it doesn't like um, config uh, no, I'm sorry, deployment configs, DCs. Um, has anybody ran into that? I had to convert a bunch of stuff to just deployments. Um, just wondering if anybody's seen anything like that uh, with Istio in particular. 
I, I can tell you, um, John, that we were switching from deployment configs to deployments um, with our customers uh, just to be more to Kubernetes. Um, and uh, I, I didn't understand if you want to have an experience report of that, but it's a matter of a few seconds to change yeah, the deployment a... config to a deployment. Yeah. And the difference is that you have to restart uh, on every on every push of your images, you have to restart your your um, containers, but you can uh, mitigate that with if you use um, GitOps tools like Argo CD. We use Argo CD, and Argo CD can help you a lot in restarting deployments if new images are available. If, yeah, we I use, don't know uh, if we use Jenkins for a lot of our deployment stuff, but yeah, it was just odd because I, I I I probably have about a hundred and 150 deployment configs and going through and uh, changing those is just, it's going to be a, a pain. But you need uh, like I, said, I was that, just wondering <laughs> if somebody had yeah. any experience with it. Yeah, um, yeah. you need some things that there, restarts so. your containers. And yep. uh, if you use, I, I can heavily um, uh, propose to use Argo CD or a GitOps mm -hmm. tool like that. Yeah. That changes your images, image tag, and obviously will roll out your new deployment and restart your okay. containers with that. Alrighty, like I said, I figured give it a whirl because the Istio uh, group didn't have anything to say about it either. So I don't know if if deployment configs are just not supported in Istio, uh, which I would find odd, um, but maybe not since it's not Kubernetes specific. So anyway. That's all I got. I, I think a default uh, FinSafU OpenShift or OKD versions is uh, to use deployments, not deployment configs. I read something about uh, in that uh, uh, on that in uh, change logs that the new default is uh, in OpenShift uh, are deployments and not deployment configs. Yeah, we use a bunch of templates, so. But uh, yeah, it, it's just. One of those things about you know moving to a new system and trying to use new technology, you have to you know re redo some of our work, but you know that's probably a good thing um, in general. Thank you, man. All right, cool. Anybody else's problems we can solve in the next ten minutes? Um, otherwise, I might give you all ten minutes back, and um, we'll we'll get. Um, Mike, you if, set up to, to run next one's next meeting. I, I would I would propose to to block all um, 1.7 releases until the next release, if it works and um, has solved all problems um, that we were suffering uh, since a few releases, like this harder version thing, the the um, IP tails problem with the routers, and so on. I I would really like to propose to block all intermediate re releases if that is possible. So users that uh, want to upgrade from 4.6 get a fine 4.7 release that uh, works out of the box without every any surprises. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, if we've got a few more minutes, I could comment on that as well. Uh, because the... Uh, uh, like I just saw this morning, uh, somebody was looking for, uh, somebody was asking for a uh, long-term support version, uh, which uh, Kristen properly shot down because uh, this is self-supported anyway. But uh, it could be what the person was actually trying to get at was uh, that a stable stream is really stable as opposed to a testing stream or a next stream or something like that. Uh, and from Vadim's comment, I could understand that it would be complicated to set up these other streams, but uh, I could interpret what Joseph was just asking for as a stable stream. Uh, and uh, so any, anybody that's wanting to actually use this for real as opposed to just a testing lab uh, doesn't want things to have the potential of breaking whenever they're doing a new version. Uh, because you know you, you can lose like uh, two weeks and uh, a reinstall and redeploying everything from source, which is uh, a bit inconvenient. 
but from my perspective, what we have currently is a, is a, a fast channel and not right. a stable channel. We we always, in every version of OKD, we have a point that we have a, a stable version, but some since 4.6, we have lots of not so stable versions. I would expect more in a, in a fast channel. I, I think a stable channel with really community approved stable tag would be a great idea. What yeah. does, when you say stable, do you mean zero bugs? Do you mean it's installable no. and upgradable or? Not, not zero bugs, uh, but something like uh, the hardest problems that block you completely are solved. Like, we like have, this, uh, yeah. We have tests to, to ensure that. We know that vSphere and AWS are installable and upgradable. It doesn't mean your particular setup will install, but there is no viable way how we can do that. I mean, I, I can understand yeah. a custom mm -hmm. version plus OpenShift as the end, but yeah. that would explode our metrics by, by million. Uh, OCP has nightlies, and we only block on two jobs. The others are informing, mostly because we won't be able to keep up with the level of testing we need to find. To mm. I maybe an idea. It's an idea that if you get the feedback from enough people that this version is absolutely fine, that we mark it as stable. And and yeah. um, that means that means we won't have a stable version in months, in in maybe years, most likely yeah. years. Yeah, years. Yeah, yes. but <laughs> maybe that's great. I mean, I'm fine with that. The problem is we have to support the existing stable version, which we have declared previously stable. We, that means somebody has to do this, this work. I am not signing up this ever. Um, but if we have a state, we have a rolling distro, that's absolutely okay. But some, uh, maybe it makes sense if enough people say in this rolling distro, we have one channel. Yeah. We mark some versions as more stable than the others and they go over to a different channel, which gets not updated You're every really two weeks. Really we're getting to the point of talking about now we're going to have checkpoints and stable release tags and like yeah no if we do that like the first of all Fedor Corio's people will be very angry with us if we start doing that because they don't they are trying very hard to kill that idea flat on the ground and the OCP people will be angry at us because now we are we are going to create a problem in which we are either holding back things but they are themselves releasing to production, which at, creates all kinds of weird questions about what is upstream, sidestream, downstream, what's the release cadence, what's going on here. Like, it is not practical for us to move like that. And it is also not practical for us to suggest that we can move slower than OCP itself, because at, at the end of the day, they're the folks making like the majority of the code that, that makes the OKD thing. Um, if, if anything, if there is a problem with your use case or whatever, and you don't have a way to make sure it stays fixed, then that is a defect in the testing apparatus and not a defect in the code base because fixing it once and then having a test to make sure it doesn't break again is the whole effing point. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know if it's, if my, if my um, wish is something um, feasible, but maybe all people that use OKD in production, maybe you understand me, that it would be great to have some kind of um, tag that assures you that, yeah, um, lots of people say this version is absolutely usable because I have a few situations with my team that we were... <laughs> Well, maybe you, you can follow my chat conversations um, that we had situations that were, were great with OKD, but also we had uh, upgrades that were absolutely mess. A few ones. I can, yeah. I can perfectly understand the goal to have the stable release, and we have the stable release. The question is, how do we achieve this in a feasible way so that we wouldn't yeah. have to wait for somebody on PTOs to to get us the final approval to actually release it. Well, Absolutely, you know, that's a question. Things that would mitigate it that wouldn't be that terrible. Um, 
like I, I know that uh, the, like some sometimes something that is wallet. totally silly can take your entire cluster down in a non-recoverable way. Uh, so like uh, the like I, I lost my test cluster because of the uh, uh, non base sixty four encoded uh, uh, password, uh, you know authentication part, which had worked up until then, and <sighs> sort. Certainly, it would have been really, because it had worked through many upgrades, it would have been nice if the release notes had said, oh, hey, by the way, this is going to kill your system if you don't fix this first. Uh, because uh, you know, once the system was going, the MCO would not pick up the new correct pull secret. Okay, it just kept perseverating and... Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, like on Slack, I, when I put that up, you know, Vadim said, try this. Okay, I tried that, didn't work. Uh, John said, oh, yeah, no, I, I had to rebuild my system. And, okay, so fine. Uh, yeah, so that's the tricky system. part. In a work, world of hurt, okay? This is, this uh, is a tricky part. And we effectively cannot automatically test it because all our CI systems have to report back so that we could collect a meaningful stats. Right. This so is a, a very way of, of going back. Okay, like uh, you know, uh, I haven't found any approved way of regressing an upgrade to the previous version so that you can try again. Uh, restart. Uh, you can restore from the backups. That's the only way to roll back the upgrade. You uh, can at CD backup or at CD backup. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but this backup does uh, not fix uh, if any um, host OS upgrades are a problem. Uh, the host apps OS is uh, reverted by RPM OS3 rollback command. And if I understood correctly, when if your system has been working perfectly, when you do an at city backup, MCD would notice that you actually should have put it in the previous deployment and do that for you. Yeah. But that assumes that MCD can actually do deployments. But um, at some point, you probably might have to help it and do things manually. How and much how uh, you, old you OS versions are... Before you start an upgrade. Sorry, you were... You were well, at the moment, I believe the backups the backups are manual, right? Yes, uh, that's a that's a other, feature which systems, we would fix. Right, many other systems do an auto backup before they upgrade. That's the so tricky part. Deployment. We only have a cluster, so when you make we can make a snapshot, but there is no place to store it because all you have is a cluster. It has to be stored somewhere else. There is no you can save it on the disk space, and if your and if your node goes down and I don't know, we corrupt the the file system, then uh, this backup is unrecoverable. The backup has oh, yeah, to be stored I mean, outside if, of the cluster. If, the and the... Bur if your cluster burns down because of a fire, I mean, at some point you're not going to be able to recover. But uh, oh, in a less well, catastrophic thing, yes. in a less catastrophic thing, then uh, that would help. It just gives a false sense of security that, yay, we made the backup, uh, don't worry, but actually it's stored down there. So it's it has to be scripted. Probably we should stress that more in the dogs that make backups. It's a critical part if you want to roll back. Um, but Before it's this, complicated. Before this thing ends and we keep going down this rabbit hole, I just have to ask something really quick. Do we actually have a way to like show people like how many people are on a particular version of OKD or something like? I I vaguely recall that we have telemetry. Do we have like some kind yes. of yes. graph or something that we could put on a web page somewhere that shows no. like, how many different types of things are on the versions? It's all um, it's all it's private. Yeah, it's all private background stuff. Also, we can. Uh, the problem is that only folks who are using Red Hat's full secret are signed in. So this number, which is around 500 now, doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us how many are outside. So the count mean from Fedora might give us some ballpark number, but again, it's very hard to say. Yeah. So then we should should we ask to figure out a way to leverage count me to say 
this is an OKD F cause node and count those and whatnot. Like I don't but know like, there. something. Something. If someone if the actual ask is what it sounds like, is that somebody wants to know how many people are on a particular snapshot version, whatever, on a different type of infrastructure, that should be a question we can answer. We can answer that yeah, using telemetry, but not with company. <laughs> it's time, time to break. Time out. Time out. So I would like to move this into either the, the Kubernetes chat channel um, or onto the mailing list. I think it's good content, um, but I do have to kill you all and stop this um, this meeting now so I can jump into another one because I can see the next ground of folks are joining. Um, but, you know, it's definitely, you know, it, the more testing we can do, the better. I'm just going to. The, mess to the message is we are earning with this. We are earning money with uh, OKD currently, and we are switching to OpenShift because we have lots of uh, business critical applications running on OKD. It's, that's perfectly fine for us, but it's absolutely great for getting uh, your feet on Kubernetes cloud technologies and. That's uh, why it is worse to get, yeah, OKD in your in your company. Yes, we all want you all to make money any way you can, <laughs> and um, we all want you to test. So thank you all. We'll do this. Uh, we'll have something on the twentieth in the docs. Joseph, I'll talk to you again. We can talk yeah. about this in your talk on Monday that you're recording. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get we'll get there. Thank you all for coming today, and um, always a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.